on Jerusalem Dateline. This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Trump advisors talk peace to Israel and Palestinians, but one U.S. congressman says the idea of a two-state solution may be a thing of the past. Those assumptions are really in doubt, are being questioned. And, and some of the questions are, what's in the best interest of the people? And a Christian country that's saying no to the European Union's Islamic blackmail. Plus, 120 years since Jewish people decided on a state. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. President Trump is pressing ahead with the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, but visiting U.S. congressmen say the situation on the ground is not what it seems. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with Trump advisors Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt in Tel Aviv. We have uh, a lot of uh, things to talk about, how to uh, advance peace, stability, and security in our region, prosperity too. And I think uh, all of them are within our reach. The president is very committed to uh, achieving a solution here that will be able to bring prosperity and peace to all people in this area. While Netanyahu's office described the talks as constructive and substantive, U.S. Well, Congressman Mac the, Thornberry uh, told CBN News uh, the U.S. Uh, may uh, need uh, to rethink the I, solution. I, I, the key fundamental point is that what we have always believed, that there has to be a two-state solution, that Israel can be more secure if it trades off some land that would become a Palestinian state. Those assumptions are really in doubt, are being questioned. And, and, and some of the questions are, what's in the best interest of the people? Protesting Palestinians expressed their displeasure ahead of Kushner's meeting with President Mahmoud Abbas. We are totally unhappy that this American administration has conducted no pressure on Israel to stop settlement activities that are killing any potential for peace. Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria remain one of the thorniest issues in the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Senator James Lankford told CBN News that worldwide perception of growth in the region is inaccurate. A lot of the growth, just population growth, uh, what some people call settlements, is really just new people born and new houses need to be built. Uh, so there's a lot of those new neighborhoods that are coming up as well as expansion of existing neighborhoods just to support the population of so many Jews moving from around the world uh, still to Israel as well as those that are born here uh, just needing new places. And Lankford says there's more that you don't see in the media. In just a couple of years since I've been in the uh, Samaria area, for instance, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of growth in factories and development. Many of those factories uh, popping up that area have Israelis and Palestinians working together side by side. Thornberry hopes there's change ahead. If we are creative and think outside the box, maybe that, that there are new possibilities. And, and that's in everybody's best interest, especially the people who live in Israel and in the West bank area. Both congressmen made it clear it's ultimately up to the Israelis and Palestinians to make peace, not the U.S. It's enough to make a lot of Westerners jealous. A nation that has rediscovered its Christian roots, has closed its borders to illegal immigrants, and has rewritten its constitution to protect the family and the unborn. Dale Hurd reports from Budapest on a renaissance of Christianity in Eastern Europe. In a time when most of Europe is in the grips of atheism, there is a nation where Christianity seems to not only be holding its own, but some say is thriving. Imagine a government that is unabashedly Christian, that thinks Christian values are worth defending, that wants to protect and even nourish the family. Welcome to Hungary. Hungary's constitution is explicitly Christian. It says that marriage is between one man and one woman, and that life begins at conception. It even includes the phrase, God bless the Hungarians. Hungary's faith church with 300 branches is one of the largest Pentecostal churches in Europe, with 70,000 attenders. And the Hungarian government has taken on the role of protecting Christianity. It's even set up an office to help persecuted Christians worldwide. When CBN News brought to the world the story of Sweden's threat to deport Iranian actress Aydin Stranson back to Islamic Iran, 
only one nation stepped up and offered her asylum, Hungary. The Hungarian government says taking in persecuted Christians is our moral and constitutional duty. Hungary uh, wants to protect uh, the European values, the European Christian and Jewish values. Hungarian policy analyst Istvan Pota says Hungary has only returned to its roots as a historic bastion of Christianity, dating back over a thousand years and despite almost 200 years of Muslim Ottoman rule. And after World War II, Soviet communist domination. Secretary of State Zoltan Kovac. You have to stick to your traditions and legacies. Europe's legacy is a Christian legacy. Not necessarily in a religious form, but most definitely in a cultural form. And it's this belief that has Hungary locked in a battle with the European Union over migrants. Mr. Orban has accused the EU of trying to Islamize Europe. And Hungary has infuriated Brussels by building a fence to keep illegal migrants out. The European Union is ticked because Viktor Orban has told Brussels to essentially take a hike when it comes to open borders. Hungary has seen the terrorism and chaos caused by migration in Western Europe and has said, not here. The European Union has even gone to court to force Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic to take in migrants. Mr. Orban has accused Brussels of blackmail. Securing the borders to stop illegal migration is indeed a solution and is the only way actually to reinstate law and order at the borders of the European Union and not the other way around. Kovac says it matters that most of the migrants trying to enter Hungary are Muslim and he says Western European nations are paying a heavy price by pretending that Islam doesn't matter. We've been living together or living close to uh, Islam for centuries uh, in the past and we all know about it. So that's why it, it does matter who is coming and in what manner uh, people are coming. Orban is often portrayed in the Western media as sort of a version of Vladimir Putin, an undemocratic strongman. In fact, at an EU summit a few years ago, the European Commission president reportedly greeted Orban with the words, hello, dictator. Hungary is certainly not a dictatorship. But Orban's critics accuse him of corruption and using the instruments of government against his political opponents, including the recent billboard campaign against billionaire George Soros. What we see today in Hungary is the shameless use of public money, of tax money, to formulate pro-government messages. Since 2010, um, the Hungarian government has been continuously weakening the system of checks and balances in Hungary and weakening democratic institutions. But Orban, a man who even his critics concede is a skilled politician, doesn't have a serious political rival. He will probably remain in power, meaning Hungary's standoff with the European Union over migrants is likely to escalate. But it also means that Hungary will continue to have a government that thinks Christianity is worth protecting. Dale Hurt, CBN News, Budapest. Coming up, marking a key event that played a major role in the birth of the Jewish state. God says, and I will take you to the place that I will designate, that I will have marked. He wants you to know that he's got his feet, as it were, on the ground, in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount. As Israel approaches its 70th anniversary of statehood, a key event in Switzerland more than 100 years ago was instrumental in the birth of the Jewish state. In 1897, Jewish leaders from around the world gathered in Basel, Switzerland to discuss the idea of a Jewish state. They were trying to combine the practical with the ideal. The ideal was to establish a Jewish state, but there were already practical steps on the ground. Historian Michael Widlansky says Jewish pioneers were already here trying to farm the barren land. Theodor Herzl said, we need a state. And he predicted that in 50 years from 1897, there would be a Jewish state. And sure enough, there was. Herzl, a Viennese journalist, initially believed the Jewish people should assimilate into the Christian world to be accepted. That changed after he witnessed rampant anti-Semitism in France. Herzl then wrote about the idea of a Jewish state. 
On August 29, 1897, he opened the first Zionist Congress, declaring they were laying the foundation stone of the house that would shelter the Jewish people. The Congress wanted to set up an idea, uh, a program. They called it the Basel Program. It was a very starry-eyed program, but with its feet on the ground. According to Widlansky, the initial goal was the organization of various Jewish groups worldwide. They wanted to get them together on the same page, organize financing, organize uh, transport, continuing organization for bringing people from many, many countries, different languages, into this faraway country that was mostly desert. And again, they succeeded. He said the name Zion pointed to the importance God himself put on this place. It comes from the Hebrew term Tzion. Tzion literally means the place that God made his mark. He signified it. God says, and I will take you to the place that I will designate, that I will have marked, which I will have chosen. That is Zion. That is God's place on earth where he chooses to be recognized. Of course, he's everywhere. But he wants you to know that he's got his feet, as it were, on the ground, in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount. And in just 50 years, despite Russian persecution, two world wars, and the Holocaust, Israel was reborn. Visitors to Jerusalem often place written prayers in the cracks of the Western Wall. Have you ever wondered what happens when those crevices get too full? Here's the answer. 10 million people visited the Western Wall last year. Many of them tucked prayer requests between the ancient stones. This wall is very famous to, for Jewish people to come and to pray and to put uh, requests even in writing uh, to God. And uh, this is a tradition for thousands and thousands of years. This is the retaining wall of the plaza of the Second Temple from 2,000 years ago. When King Solomon dedicated the first temple, God said his eyes and heart would always be there. That's why traditionally Jews and those of other faiths put their prayers in the wall. If they can't make the trip, they send their requests via post, email, or even text. So what happens when those cracks get too full? Twice a year, the prayer slips are removed from the old stones. Western Wall Rabbi Shmuel Rabinovich says no one reads the papers because they're notes between man and his creator. Workers collect the notes, bundle them in bags, and later bury them in the cemetery on the Mount of Olives. According to Jewish religious practice, it's forbidden to destroy anything on which the name of God is written. That means these little prayer slips are treated with the same respect as worn or damaged Torah scrolls and prayer books. Up next, a Jewish man who found refuge during World War II in China and in God. And my father told me that the Word of God kept him alive. During World War II, European Jews who could escape the terror of Nazi Germany fled to some of the most unlikely places. Here's the story of one man who found refuge in Shanghai, China and in God. It was part of history that no one can forget. During the reign of Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler, Jews lived under daily terror. Their synagogues were burned, and millions were sent to concentration camps. Six million perished. Some nations opened their doors to the fleeing Jews. China was one of them. Many Jewish families applied for visas to come to China. All of a sudden, cities like Shanghai became home of the Jewish refugees. Many were relieved that China was a safe place, a country that changed their lives. Elizabeth Linton was born in Austria. She and her husband recently visited Shanghai, China. Not for sightseeing, but in memory of her deceased father, Michael Weiss, who came to Shanghai after fleeing the Holocaust. Weiss was born in Vienna, Austria, after Hitler overran the country. As they drew, he realized that he couldn't safely remain in the country. Uh, after he came to Shanghai, he um, 
I was working as an engineer. He had graduated from the university in Vienna. He was about 25 years old at the time. When I hear stories about how the nations, many of the nations, including America, uh, turned away Jewish people seeking refuge, it, uh, it really is heartbreaking when you think about it. But look at what the Chinese people did. They opened their arms to a persecuted people. Some came without visas, some came without passports, without proper documentation. And soon after he met the uh, Stearns family, Theodore and Carol Stearns, they had four children, and they introduced him to Watchman Nee in the church in Shanghai. Watchman Nee was a church leader and Christian teacher who worked in China at the time. Exposed to many Chinese Christians, Weiss was deeply touched by their help and love for him. He learned about the Bible from the Chinese Christians. Watchman Nee gave him the name Johannes, and Johannes stands for John. Just when Weiss thought things would get better, the Japanese military invaded Shanghai, and he was taken prisoner and sent to a concentration camp. During the imprisonment, he was threatened numerous times with death. However, Weiss only did two things, read the Bible and pray. Weiss could not return to Vienna until the end of World War II. He immediately started a new life. And he prayed. I have uh, many prayers that he wrote down for his children that we would come to know God early in life and embrace the faith in God with all our hearts. Today, as she walks around the Shanghai Jewish Refugee Museum, she was drawn to all the memories here. It made it real that he, he was here, and especially the name of John that was given to him. Johannes Michael Weiss passed away in 1983. With a degree in theology studying, he never stopped giving praises for the Chinese who introduced him to the Lord. And my father told me that the Word of God kept him alive. Meng Fei Li, CBN News. Coming up, archaeology from the early church and the Bible. Finding something like this is so far the height of my career. The discovery of a mosaic floor near the Damascus Gate of Jerusalem's old city is being hailed as an archaeological miracle. Here's what Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist David Gelman had to say about the find. A find like this is extremely exciting. Um, it's not every day that one finds an inscription, a, a direct letter from someone from almost 1,500 years ago. The excavation uncovered a rather large room with a mosaic tile floor. Most of the mosaic tile is simple white, but in this area we uncovered an inscription in black tiles. The inscription is in Greek, six rows of words. The inscription describes uh, the dating under uh, Justinian, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire in the middle of the 6th century AD and mentions the name of the man who was in charge of the project of building this building, maybe a monastery or a church. His name is Constinius. The same man is mentioned in a separate inscription inside the old city in the Nea church, the new church of uh, Mary, mother of Jesus. This teaches us that Constinius was in charge not only of that single church inside the walls of the city, but also of a complex of churches and monasteries of which many parts have been uncovered outside the walls of the city. The area here has been the subject of many salvage excavations, among others for before building a uh, petrol station and a large um, city road. Um, a complex of monasteries and churches have been uncovered over the past several dozen years. And this connects us to the churches inside the city. This is along the way, the main road into Jerusalem at the time. Finding something like this is so far the height of my career. Further north in the Galilee, Archaeologists believe they've uncovered clues that lead them to the place of biblical Bethsaida. Take a look at what you can see on our social media channels. We are uh, on the northern shore of the Kinneret Lake, Sea of Galilee, a site called in Hebrew Beit Habek. The site was known since the end of the 19th century as an ancient site and one of the three candidates to identify uh, Bethsaida.
bathhouse is something that leads us to understanding that we are within some kind of a city. Though the dig here is very small, it immediately hinted us to suggest that we discovered the city of Julius. Now, what is the city of Julius? We were talking about Bethsaida. Josephus Flavius, the Jewish historian in the first century, tells us that King Philip, the son of Herod the Great, who ruled from here to the Golan, towards Damascus, decided to upgrade the village of Bethsaida and to make it a polis by the name of Julius. There is a uh, document from a visitor uh, from the uh, end of the 7th century AD, a Christian pilgrim, who says that after he left Capernaum, he arrived to Bethsaida, and there is a church for the apostles Peter and Andrew. So for the Christians in the 6th, 7th, 8th century, it was still called Bethsaida. But if we will succeed in proving scientifically that this is the place of Julius, therefore Bethsaida, I think it can be developed into an interesting site for people who are interested in being in the place where the apostles live. That's all for this edition, and that wraps up our sixth season of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And remember, the God who watches over Israel, and you and me, neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time as we open our seventh season of Amazing News and Features on Jerusalem Dateline.